So thank you all for coming today um, to this session on class in the TV and film industries, which someone else came up with a clever title, The Class Ceiling. Um, I'm Izzy Charm and I'm the Vice Chair of the Writers, Producers and Directors Branch of BEC2, who have organised this programme of events today. Um, and we decided to do this event because we think the issue of class diversity in these industries is something we feel strongly about and that hasn't necessarily been properly addressed by the industry. So on behalf of the branch, I'd like to welcome you all here today. And also, I'm very honoured to welcome such a prestigious panel um, to discuss this issue with you. So just some very brief introductions. Um, firstly, Ken Loach, I'm sure he needs no introduction here amongst us. But um, what I would like to say is you know, we're very lucky to have someone with so many years, I won't specify how many, but so many years of experience <laughs> in, in both film and TV, from working in-house in the BBC in the 60s, making such iconic films as Cat to Come Home, through numerous documentaries, and um, obviously, you know, best known for feature films, and also a member of the committee, so thank you very much, Ken, for coming. Um, we've also got Dan Wilkes from Creative Skillset, who is a research manager there. So he's here to talk about the latest workforce survey that um, Skillset have done, which was just published last week and which has some very interesting results that relate to, you know, the class um, profile of the industry. Someone else who knows a lot about the, the industry and how it's, what its composition is Professor Keith Randall, who's here from the University of Hertfordshire, and he's worked for the best part of two decades in this, in this area of employment within the creative industries and issues like inclusion and exclusion. Finally, Jimmy McGovern, who's travelled all the way down from Liverpool to be here today, so thank you very much for that. Um, again, needs very little introduction. One of our most respected and successful screenwriters, with work ranging from soaps like Brookside, to political dramas and documentaries, to some of our best-loved TV series like Cracker, The Street and Banished, which I'm sure lots of you have enjoyed, like I have. So please join me in welcoming them here today. Today, um, the issue of class diversity within the industry. Um, you know, diversity more generally is an issue that Beck2 feels very strongly about and campaigns a lot about. Um, you know, and I think the industry has started to acknowledge more generally the issue of diversity, you know, which is a big problem. And as our, our panel probably fairly accurately represents, you know, the gender and ethnicity um, composition of the industry. <laughs> but um, today we're here to talk about a slightly less visible problem. Um, you know, the, the problem perhaps with classes is quite so, you know, it's less tangible, it's less visible than these other diversity issues. So the way this is going to work is, um, I'm going to stop talking, I'm going to hand over to our panellists, um, and we'll kind of open it up periodically to the floor, so, you know, we want this to be a conversation, really. We're going to start with Dan, is going to give us a short presentation just to show us what skill the skill set survey has found that, that he thinks is relevant to the issue of class in the industry. And um, yeah, we'll take it from there. So over to Dan. Uh, hi everyone, just bear with me a second. This is uh, where um, I'm going to be sabotaged by technical issues, no doubt. So, which I've just handed over. Ah, oh, there we go, not too bad. For anyone panics, I've only got four slides, so <laughs> not to worry, not to worry. So, uh, Creative Skills have been undertaking a survey of individuals working in the creative media industry since 2003. By creative media, we're referring to film, TV, uh, VFX, video games, digital, radio, uh, and animation. Uh, and I just wanted to bring out a few of the key points that reflect uh, and support the, the theory of the class ceiling and, and highlight some of the barriers that people from uh, low socioeconomic backgrounds uh, perhaps encounter. Uh, first of all is unpaid work. Um, across creative media as a whole, 48% of people had undertaken unpaid work. Um, and as you can see, it's slightly higher in TV, but the big one there is film, where it's 74% of people working in that industry. Um, uh, undertaken unpaid work. And the big, the really telling thing with this stat is that across all sectors it, it's gone up since when we last recorded it in 2010. Uh, and this is based on, on, a, on a sample of 5,000 people from the industry, so it's fairly robust. Um, unpaid work experience, so anybody that's done work experience before their first job, um, as you can see here um, in creative media, 
uh, 77% of those people, their work experience was unpaid. Uh, and with work experience, it's quite a broad definition. It's, it's any kind of internship, work experience, work-based um, uh, development that takes place before their first job. And again, film, TV is higher on 82%, but has remained constant since 2010. Uh, film has actually increased since 2010, and is the highest overall at 84% of people. Um, so some serious issues there with, with unpaid work and work experience. Uh, the survey also found that 56% of people um, had found their latest job through informal recruitment methods, so things like friends of friends, word of mouth, um, getting in touch with people, getting in touch from previous jobs, that type of thing. Um, and that's actually a 10% increase on 2010. Uh, and it, it's a similar level for, for film and TV, around about 56%, slightly higher in TV, uh, in film, sorry. Um, the last thing we looked at, and this is the first time we've ever collected this information in the survey, is educational background and what type of school people went to. Um, in creative media as a whole, we found that 14% went to a fee-paying private school. Uh, that was 15% in TV and slightly higher at 19% in film. And although you, know, you might look to see that and think, no, it's not that high compared to some of the figures that we see, that is double the proportion of the UK population that go to those schools. Uh, and when uh, you, you do some additional analysis and look at senior managers or directors and producers, that's where the figure shoots up often to around 30%. Um, and, uh, and I think a uh, study um, um, looked at the top 100 professionals in media and it's around about 44% went to private schools. So that's just four of the really key points that come out and, and kind of really fuel this, this debate and, and this issue. Um, so um, that's it on the slideshow. So I think fairly, you know, those results show us that having money and knowing the right people are two very important things in getting into and staying into the industry, which, you know, is very relevant in terms of socioeconomic background. Um, I think I'll just ask each of our panellists if that's okay to kind of respond to that. Should we start with you, Keith, and talk about if that fits in with the bigger picture of, you know, your research? Is that an accurate portrayal of of the industry. Okay, thanks. I'll stand up as well. <coughs> um, yeah, first of all, the first thing I want to say is uh, I'm very grateful to, to Creative Skill Set for producing their, the, the workforce surveys that they do and the censuses that they do because they're really vital tools. I think if you're addressing things like inequalities, um, we've got to have some uh, fairly hard facts and uh, statistics, and from an academic point of view, they're, they're really useful. Um, I think what they do though is they give us snapshots, really useful snapshots. They show us what the trends are, uh, you know, what's happening in terms of things like uh, uh, um, social composition of the various industries that make up uh, the creative sector. What they don't tell us, uh, and they're not expected to, you know, it's not a criticism, is why they are as they are. So we might think there are some clues in there, but I think what we also have to do is then delve into that a bit and sort of try to find out um, why they are like they are, because if we don't know uh, what kind of mechanisms are at work, then how can we really do anything about it? You know, we might try various interventions, but we don't really know if they're going to work unless we've got some sort of clue about what the dynamic is uh, that's going on here. Uh, now, I'm not going to kind of go all academic on you and give you a, a long lecture on this, um, but I, I think there are two really key things here that we need to look at. One is the whole way that these industries are structured. Um, that things like the fact that they're project-based, uh, jobs are quite short-term, lots of people are freelance, recruitment is informal. That's all part of the characteristics of these these industries. And I think uh, you know if you if you add to that the characteristics of the individuals who are trying to get into them and are trying to get on in them, uh, together that complex mix makes up the the, the reality that we see. Um, so things like the way the industry is structured will determine um, the fact that there are, um, you know, not entirely, but the fact that there are uh, unpaid uh, internships, that recruitment takes place by word of mouth, uh, there is a tendency to, you know, we talk about these industries as having a degree of nepotism, about it being who, who you know rather than what you know, all those sort of things that you've heard, you're only as good as your last job, all these kind of things are to do with uh, uh, a project-based um, 
short-term job industry. Now, if you then look at the people who are trying to get in on the other hand, uh, and I'm going to be very brief about this, as I said, there's a danger of becoming very academic, but I've um, been using quite a well-known, uh, quite a well-known French sociologist, uh, Pierre Bourdieu, uh, and he, he talks about people having capitals. Uh, he talks about them having economic capital, social capital, and cultural capital. And very, very briefly, um, if you've got economic capital, let's say you've got wealthy parents, then it's easier to survive an inter uh, unpaid internship than it is if you haven't. Um, social capital, if you, uh, that refers to things like the networks that you're in. Uh, and of course, we all go around and we try to build networks, and uh, we can do that quite actively, and everybody's encouraged to do it, and it's part of being a freelancer. But some people have networks from the day they're born. So if you go to a private school, uh, for instance, um, you know, one of the top public schools, then the parents of all the other people who will be there will be already part of an elite. And you're already then, um, you already have access uh, to people who might be in a position of um, some influence. So that's quite important. So there's the social capital. And the third bit, uh, and the last thing I'm going to talk about, is what, he, what Bourdieu called cultural capital. And that's sort of a little bit harder to, it's a bit more intangible in a way. Um, I, some of the work I've done has explored that with people um, and they talk about it uh, actually coming down to things like the clothes you wear, the accent that you have, you know, do you have a regional accent, do you have a northern accent? Uh, even people talked about, uh, women generally talked about the make, not having the right makeup. So these are the really very difficult uh, signs that, that people have that I think very difficult to deal with. So, I know, I'm not going to say any more, I could go on for an hour, but um, those I think are, I'll come back to, set, to, to repeating my point really, that I think skill set has done a fantastic job, always does with these reports, very useful, um, but we do have to get underneath those and find out what the dynamics are that are causing um, uh, the workforce to be in the creative industries um, to be reproduced in its own like over and over again. and also some of the reasons perhaps why you know it's heading in that direction that you need these yeah you need to be rich you need to look right you need to know the right people um i'm going to turn to jimmy now can you tell us about you know how that relates to your own experience of the industry and, and what that means for the industry well i think if you've got a story to tell and and you're able to tell that story you've still got a hell of a good chance you know but uh, peter james is here and uh, he gave me my first big break and uh, he also set up the Theatre Writers Workshops up on the um, Merseyside, which are still in existence today. And, and he didn't just preach it, Pedder. You went out and got working class people interested and involved in the theatre and, ga and gave me a huge break, you know. Um, but the th thing, I, and at that time, um, this is the thing that's really changed for a writer. Um, uh, at that time, I was a head case. I was a working class man given a break and nobody was going to stop me. And I was totally narcissistic, totally concerned about my, my work, my story. I'd kill anybody, you know. And <laughs> these, days, these days, I would not have lasted, I, would, I, I just wouldn't have lasted, would I better? Because well, what happens today is, what happens today is producers pick on writers with whom they're comfortable. And they pick on writers who can work a room. And Pedder and way back in the 80s, uh, producers picked on writers who'd empty a room. You know, and they were writers. But I think that's the essential difference now, Peter, to say, that uh, people work with people with whom they're comfortable. Whereas in the 80s, that was not the case. You know, I, I, I felt. Yeah. I think a round of applause for Peter. This was actually in the late 70s, in the very end of the 70s. Uh, uh, I, I, I first saw uh, work by Jimmy in an amateur theatre ten days before Mrs. Thatcher was elected. Uh, and that's obviously a significant fact. Uh, but I can say that then, in the 70s, the sort of people that we wanted to work with were people like Jimmy, who <laughs> we don't necessarily, if we are in any sort of power situation in the industry, we don't necessarily want to work with people like Jimmy these days. The truth of the fact, but we did want the people like him there. Yes. Um, well, I, I think what's just been said is, is very true. Um, but I was going to come at, come at it from a slightly different point of view, really. Um, and to say, 
what effect has this had on the content? And how does the, the class ceiling prevent the representation of class interests? And what we're about as a trade union is to cure jobs, good wages and good working conditions. And those are the very elements and the very ideas that are now not present in the majority of programmes. Um, we said we would talk about films, and I think I don't want to waste too much time talking about films, because the most films that people see are American films. They're either fantasy and very escapist, where it's about power and guns, or it's about characters who have so much wealth that, that is never accounted for, and the films celebrate the wealth. And that, of course, has a class connotation, because where does the wealth come from? Um, you will occasionally see films where, uh, about Wall Street, you know, greed is good, good, good phrase, but the, the consequences of that for the working class is actually never acknowledged. And the film, and the, I, forgot, I was sitting here trying to remember its name, and it's gone out, the senior moment has gone out of my head, I think it was the Scorsese film with a, a guy who indulges great wealth and is... Wolf of Wall, Wall Street, thank you. Um, that was, that was a, a, on the surface, if you reduce it to one line, it was about the corruption of, of wealth and the rabid grabbing of wealth, but the consequences of it weren't in the film. So that the consequences for the working class, for the exploited, were not there. So, I mean, there's lots to say about cinema, but that, that, that was the one thought. I think the, the consequences in broadcasting are very serious and we've seen it we've seen it epitomized in the coverage of the election but to break it down into three sections in terms of fiction i think it is possible still to reflect working class issues occasionally and jimmy does it better than anyone um, but you can see it sometimes in one film or in one series but the series that have the mass the greatest effect like hospital dramas, for example. <coughs> now, from a working class point of view, if you're working in a hospital, you're worried about, as we know, from the privatizations, from the agency workers, from the cutbacks, from the effects of uh, social care cuts, these are not in the drama. And this is where the, 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 the class interest is actually absent. And that's not coincidence. That's, that's built into the way fiction is seen as a kind of, um, as something to engage you, um, to pass the time, but not engage the brain. In terms of documentaries, again, it gets tighter. I mean, we've had, we've had the most disgusting documentaries in Channel 4, with Benefit Street, and even worse, Benefits Britain, which is to parade people who are the most vulnerable, who are the poorest, in dire need and presented as grotesques and caricatures and to be <coughs> condemned, scorned, have contempt for. And that's, that mirrors the political agenda of the right-wing press, the Mail and the Express, the scroungers, the strivers, not skivers, is mirrored in our broadcasting. Occasionally you'll get a program about housing, there was one on the BBC, but the overwhelming persuade documentary element is the right-wing element. But when you get to news and current affairs, that's when it really kicks in. And you see the, the interests, the, the class interests, the working class interests, in fact they don't even talk about working class, it's working people. Now, I mean the, the class has been dissolved. You're just all working people. Um, you have no class interest. Um, and the, the, the interests of working class people have been eliminated from our political discourse, almost eliminated. Um, I mean, to take one example, you have, um, the charge was Labour is anti-business. Who was anti-union? Did it matter? No, of course it didn't. Um, 
the, 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 the question, I, I jotted one statistic down. <coughs> um, you remember when Len McCluskey came out uh, shortly after the election and said that um, Labour, the, the unions might have to rethink what they did with their contributions if a very right-wing candidate was chosen. And he was excoriated. He was attacked and he was abused and he was uh, condemned for trying to manipulate a union baron, remember, union boss. Okay, that was Len McCluskey. Um, it was, there was a good piece in the, the paper a few days ago saying that JCB, huge company, gave, in the last decade, gave over six and a half million pounds to the Tories and has instructed them on what they should do in, as regards the EU. <coughs> now, where's this? Where's, where's the, where's, why is that not commented on? Why is the head of JCB not, uh, not denounced as a kind of interfering uh, city boss? Not at all. Not at all. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's, that's life. That's real. That's how it should be. But when working people get, class people get together, and organize in a union, that's not accepted. And you hear it on the Today program, you hear it on Newsnight, you hear it on the ITV equivalents. And that's where our interests as a class are denied, and the interests of the ruling class are accepted as normal, as the way the world is, as the natural order. And, that's, and it's insidious. It penetrates every question that's asked, it penetrates every assumption that we're encouraged to share. And that's the effect of this class domination. So I think it's, I think it's a really, it's a really important thing for us to consider as a union and as program makers that we have to challenge it all the time. Occasionally, yes, but um, it's it's uh, it's actually worse in the uh, print media because um, I, I I I did an episode of the street and it was a really good episode of the street and it starts off with these two guys are walking and one of them sees a house on fire and there's a kid in the upstairs window and this guy goes oh my god runs into the house breaks down the door runs up the stairs fights the flames gets the kid comes all the way down and then gives the kid to his mate and says, you did it, I'm on invalidity. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, the thing is, the thing is every working class person totally bought that and yet two critics, two critics in the right wing press both said, what a, what a ludicrous premise on which to construct a drama. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. Uh, Brookside was exceptional, it really was, you know, but even then you got things like, how many times have you heard this, it's soap opera, not soap box. You know, that was always said, you know. But Brookside was an amazing experience. And, uh, this, uh, what Brookside was, was a collection of working class people trying to learn how to make, you know, how to make a TV programme. And for 12 months we didn't know how to do it. But we learned, and after 12 months it became a good program. But for 12 months, the average age on Brookside was about 30 years of age, and nearly everybody was working class, you know. And the difference that, I mean, uh, I'll, th 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 this is, I'll keep this short. One, well, one of the things that really worked on Brookside was the writer's foot was right at the end of, of, of the site. So you came through the gate, and you had to walk past everybody. And these were all working class people. And the program hadn't kicked off yet. It was terrible. And all you'd get was, would be this terrain of abuse. What was that shite last night? Hey, hey! And the writers would be walking like this, as this hail of abuse rained down upon them. And it was the best, 
it, honestly, it, what a lesson that was. It was a great thing to do, you know. Um, it really, it really interesting. It really paid off. You know? um, I mean, I don't know what it's like in soap, you know, working soap nowadays. Oh, so it's not like that now. Uh, no. <laughs> I suppose I'd like to ask for some, um, uh, well, it's not a career advice, it's a question that I would like a true or false um, uh, answer from your perspective, but first of all about me. Um, I, am a, I am an established television producer, I'm a journalist, and uh, you detect I've got an accent, I'm hanging on to it because I was born in Transylvania at the height of communism. So I came to England encouraged by the World in Action team to become a journalist, and after two years spent as, a, as an illegal immigrant working in a fish and chip shop, I finally got married and I thought, television, here I come. I want to change the world. Um, and hand on heart, I haven't slept with anyone to get any of my jobs, so that's an achievement in itself. <laughs> and, um, you know, but um, uh, after a career break, a maternity break, I returned to television to channel for working while the Romanians are coming. And uh, in the process, I got to know people and one very senior executive producer whom I asked for advice said the following, I said look, um, I've done my bit, investigative journalism, current affairs, I've done TV producing, I really want to direct, you know, I'm 40 plus and uh, she said, Claudia, in my experience, directing opportunities on British television for people who are not born in this country are zero. So I thought, do you know what? I'm going to do what I've done before. I'm going to check it out for myself. So I set up my own television pro uh, production company, Sharpen Films, and I'm thinking whether in your experience you have met many Romanians in the creative uh, capacity, or whether it's true that there is a barrier for people who are born outside of Britain. Um, I just say, obviously it's a bit you know, away from this topic of class per se, but if someone wants to answer quickly, let's try and keep it quite focused. But you know, it's interesting what you've got to say. We have figures that suggest there's quite a high proportion of, of uh, non British people working in the TV, but we don't know what level they're working at. Okay, so we don't exist at the moment. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, anyone else got anything they want to, to ask? Let's try and keep it quite related to. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to um, talk about something that I read a couple of days ago. Um, and it's a new show that BBC Two are, um, it's supposed to be a social experiment, so it's supposed to be a very serious experiment. Um, but it's called Britain's Hardest Grafter. And this is actually about pitting, they um, cast people who are not earning money, they're either on benefits, but they're, they're not allowed to have earned in the last year more than £15,000. Um, and this is taking six or seven or eight people where they're competing to win a prize for 15 grand what they were earned in the last year, which apparently there's now a, a petition on Twitter about it, but it was only announced a couple of days ago. I just find that disgusting that they think that's acceptable TV, social experiment or not. You know, the working classes have been around forever. It's not a new thing. I don't know where this is now dubbed poverty porn, but you know, I don't know where this idea that they can exploit people to win money and pick them against each other comes from. So I was just wondering what your take on that might be. And I, guess why, and I guess why it matters, you know, why that's a bad thing as well. Um, um, well, I, 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 I share your disgust. I mean, the, um, remember the, uh, bef between the wars, the, uh, the dancing contest in the United States where people would dance until they dropped. And it is, it is about pushing people to the extreme for our entertainment. And there is the, as, as, when these programs started, I think there was a big banner. I think it was Middlesbrough Football Club uh, where one of these programs was made saying poverty is not entertainment. And I think we, we have a, a responsibility as program makers just to say no. And I think, I think the, 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 the danger is that we're, you know, we'll all sit in this room and we'll hear stories of uh, prejudice against people getting work. We'll hear stories like yours and that we all know of, of the 
degradation of people as entertainment. And we have to say no, and the union has to say no, and we have to work collectively. I mean, we're all people in are individually need jobs, and so you're asked to work on something. Well, of course you will, because you've got to eat. But the union needs to needs to start taking an attitude about this, so that we're not just wringing our hands and saying, "Isn't it terrible? Look at the job I'm having to do this week." We need we have no strength individually. We have to start taking a position and say. We will not have union members working on this crap. There are more, but there's less people from those backgrounds working yeah, in yeah. TV. There's less people that are going to be able to say, oh, that's wrong, that's not representative, this isn't fair. So we're getting a situation that's going to get, get worse and worse. Um, do you want to come to Yeah, you were talking about content. Sorry, I'm dead. Um, um, uh, um, my name is Patricia Jenkins. I went to the University of Hertfordshire, studied politics there, um, and also in Sweden. Um, but um, just talking about content, uh, um, I was talking to a, a young lady earlier about that, uh, that a lot of the programmes made are about upper class people, Danton Abbey, Sherlock, upper class or upper middle class people. You very rarely, Julie Walters was saying, you very rarely see any working class people in a leading role. I'm working on uh, two scripts at the moment, um, it, about uh, working, uh, which has a working class hero in, in one of them I'm writing, and the other one I'm researching is about Bernardo's boy who um, joins, the, joins the army and becomes a general in the British army. Something doesn't happen very often now, but did actually has happened in the past it, during the 19th century under Victoria, if it's possible. Um, in your opinion, as experienced people, any chance of those things? Um, I mean, I've had some interest in the first film, and um, the second one I haven't uh, I have to write the script. I've been researching it now for a number of years. Any chance that, that a film with working class people in a leading role um, could get commissioned or made. I mean, is there any... You're talking to two people who have managed to do that, you know, for the whole of their careers. I mean, do you think it's, do you think it's, it's hard to get things about, the sympathetic things about working class people? Um, no, you go. Uh, Give me well, time to think. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I think the BBC would have an answer and say absolutely, um, or other film producers would say, yes, absolutely. The problem is, um, well, they'd point to hundreds of films with working class characters. I mean, they'd point to all the soaps, Coronation Street, EastEnders, um, Emmerdale, or, you know, they, they, all, they all have working class characters. The, the problem is, in white and light are they seen? What are their preoccupations? Do they connect to the, to the serious economic problems that working class people face? Yeah. So it, Yes, I mean, the, the, the characters will be there. Um, that, that's, that, that's not an issue. It's what do, you, what do you want to show them doing? And will, they, will you show their strength? That's another issue. Will you show their strength? They're always presented as weak, isolated, feckless, servants, whatever. Or, or, or just run in a pub or whatever. But, but, it, but the, the, the sense of the, the political significance of working class people is that's what's missing. Yes. Seems to me. I don't know what other people would, would say. And also, I mean, I would think it's also about you know articulate working class people. Which I know you know you you know oh, yeah. one of the few people that actually show people that are articulate and have yeah. opinions and you know sensible things to say rather than kind of yeah you know just drama. Yeah, it, it's great that, isn't it? They, they expect us all to be thick. And, um, it's, 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 great to, it's great to put them on, to put people on screen who are articulate, you know, and can talk. And you know, us who have worked with their dockers up in Liverpool, and dockers are the most articulate people you've ever you've ever met in your life. And they, I, I remember asking them. I've worked with them for 14 months. I, 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 the, uh, I'm sure I'll come back to the question of a may, but I worked with these dockers for 14 months, and they knew everything. They didn't, buy, they didn't buy the Guardian, but they knew everything about international affairs. And I said to them at the end of 14 months, yeah, I did all that school at 15, you know, uh, how do you know all this, you know? And they said, Jimmy, 
A ship is a mobile factory. We walk in the hold of a ship. That sailed from South Africa. We'll know everything about what was, what was troubling those dockers in South Africa. The west coast of America. We'll know everything going on there because we've got to communicate because we all work in the same mobile factory. It was an amazing experience for me, you know. But uh, on that point, um, uh, the thing I liked about the street and accused was it, it brought back single drama and you could write about working class people and you weren't going to spend a fortune on them. Like, you can't, it's, it's hard to do a small movie. How you do it, like, not, not your, your movies are not small. Cost effective movies. Are, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Cost effective movies. <laughs> all, 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 all proper rates. Yeah. Well, at least with accused in the street, you could do it fairly cheaply, you know, and tell, tell one single story about one working class person. And we were really proud of that, but it's, it's gone now. Funny, we're talking about you know having working class characters as this kind of special thing. Where you know, most Britons, you know, are certainly a lot yeah. of people view it as like it's ridiculous. Well, well it's, it's special it, thing. What we should a working class person. I know you're also missing the trick because what you want as a writer is complication. You know, you don't you don't want you don't want complexity of plot, but you want sort of like complexity of emotional reaction. And if if you do something that has economic consequences, you know, and show them on screen. Surely that's better than avoiding it, you know. Why, you know, it, it, it's crazy. It's crazy to ignore the economic consequences of actions on the screen. I think, you know. Yeah. Um, so, sorry. I just want to bring it back to, um, you know, access to the industry again, because I think, you know, obviously we all agree that in terms of content, you know, there is a problem, and that the two problems are connected. But, you know, in terms of how people get into the industry nowadays, I mean, Ken, you did a put in on a trainee. Is that, is that right? I mean, in that, um, do, do those kind of opportunities exist nowadays? I don't know if Ethan and Dan can tell us about that afterwards, but you know, how you both got into the industry, which we're showing now has all these parents. Um, God, I, 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 I got in, um, I know it was, it was over half a century ago, actually. <laughs> um, I, I got in from university, I did a, I was a, a sort of unemployed actor for two years, and then applied to the BBC as a job as an assistant floor manager um, and got turned down and then uh, a couple of weeks later applied as uh, a trainee director and I got taken on. So <laughs> <laughs> the, the qualification for director were considerably less. <laughs> and we had a six week course, um, Gilmine Grove and um, it was mainly about the ethos of the BBC. Um, uh, which, which is, in fact, it's very interesting. It was a covert way of passing on how you were to be um, a messenger of, of the ruling class. Actually, looking back, I didn't appreciate it at the time, but it was all about what you can say and what you can't. Um, and uh, we, we got a bit worried that we weren't actually learning anything. And then we had half, half a day, uh, about three weeks in, entitled What to Do With Your Cameras. <laughs> and that, uh, that was a half a day walking around uh, a studio and um, a, a television director called, um, Dave, not David Jacobs, John Jacobs, Sunday Jacobs, I figured his first name, said the basic thing, you know, you make the, you, you rehearse it like a play, you've got three cameras, you've got a wide shot and two close-ups and you, that's what you do. Um, so that was, that was the, that was the total of our um, education. Um, but we didn't have to work for nothing. That's the point. We were paid to do well. We did it. We didn't have to work for nothing, and we didn't finish university with a great bill around our necks. So th those are the huge differences, um, and I think that's uh, a, a proper training is good. But I think on the scale it's happening, there is training for for jobs that don't exist, and I think that imbalance is is a problem we're developing because we get lots, and I'm sure Jimmy does as well, and, and anyone else in, in our position, I'm sure there's people here, lots and lots of uh, requests and letters, please can we come and work for nothing? We don't need to be paid, can we make the tea, can we, hold, can we do anything for nothing? And we all say, no, if there's a job, you'll be paid. And if there isn't, you, you can't just stand and, and do nothing. You know, and I think that, that's something we've really got to fight for, and and I hope um, I didn't hear Danny Cohen this morning, but I hope he made a commitment to end 
the unpaid interns. I doubt if he did, but he needs to. Because unpaid interns are, well, they're putting people out of work. And we know, we know the game. Let somebody work for nothing for a period. When they've done their time, kick them out and get someone else. And it, you know, it's, killing, it's killing the industry as a, as a real profession. In the, so we've, seen that we've got SN estimates that uh, it costs around £926 a month uh, for somebody to work unpaid in London. So obviously anybody from a working class background, you know, they're going to do those sums and it's obvious, isn't it? It's like, what, you know, what, how am I going to do that? How can I possibly fund myself? So, you know, a commitment from BBC and then all the broadcasters and production companies, that's, that's where the, needs, the change needs to happen, I think, to get rid of these, uh, get rid of this uh, informal recruitment. Hi, uh, exactly my question was uh, on this topic. So basically the PDFI statistics show that since 2011 there's 300% more people going for, for MA filmmaking courses and doing film studies, which is, which is great. But at the same time, the, the tuition fees are really, really expensive. And then at the same time, there are all these statistics showing the unpaid work, especially in the first year after graduation. So my question was, for crew, what would you tell to an emerging talent, especially coming from outside Greater London and coming from a, from a, a working class background, uh, how, what they should do in order to pursue their dream, to, 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 have, a, to have a job in the, in the creative industry, and for young directors as well, who, um, who know how difficult it is to make their films and to become directors, especially if they're coming from a working class background and uh, regional UK, what would you tell them? Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the picture can be pretty bleak, but people are, are doing things to try and address this. I mean, apprenticeships are, are key at the moment. Creative skills are developing apprenticeships. And the numbers are still quite small at the moment. The BBC have made commitments to take on apprenticeships, as we heard earlier. And independent companies like Shine, you know, they've launched things like The Hatch, which are taking on apprenticeships from, you know, um, from uh, sort of lower social economic backgrounds. So people are doing things, and, and there are options out there. But I would certainly think of, of maybe looking at an alternative to, 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 to the graduate uh, route, which is currently accounts for about 70 80 percent of, of the industry. Um, and so, yeah, trying to look for different diverse routes that are becoming available slowly. Um, and apprenticeships being one of them and possibly the, the, the most successful one going forward. Um, I'd say, I mean, we spoke a bit, Keith and I, about, you know, that this is one area where diversity isn't legislated for. You know, there are, there is legislation in place to try and, I mean, not necessarily successfully, but it does exist that acknowledgement of lack of diversity in other areas and the attempt to legislate for greater equality. Do you, do you want to talk to us a bit about that? I mean, do, is this something we should be thinking about legislation for? Well, I think we should, but I, but I know we'd be faced with an enormous uh, conflict over it. Um, I think partly because it's it's um, it's very contested. You, know, you put 100 people in the room that we've got here, and they may have 100 different different definitions of what what class is. I think that's part of the problem. Um, the other thing is that I think all of the, the different elements that go to make up um, diversity within an in industry are not entirely separate. So they're interconnected. So somebody isn't just working class, or isn't just uh, from a black ethnic minority, or isn't just disabled. They're, they're kind of uh, many of those things. I often think that um, you know, if if you were um, a young uh, black uh, mother living on a council estate in Newcastle, your your chances of getting into the industry uh, are incredibly low, very, very difficult. If, on the other hand, you're a young, white male and living in Muswell Hill, it's virtually obligatory. So, you know, <laughs> it, that might be overstating it a bit. But, but, but there, these are industries where there is a um, massive over... Um, uh, there's, there's a huge market, isn't there? There's a, certain, a huge army of people who want to get in. That makes it very, very um, difficult, I think, for those people. And it also means that people use all sorts of short uh, and tricks to, to take that pile of, uh, of um, applications uh, down to you know, a small uh, hand, a small enough short list to, to get who they want. Um, what can we what can we do in terms of legislation? I think that is. Um, 
incredibly difficult. I mean, even if you like, even skill sets um, uh, workforce survey picks just two elements. I mean, important ones, I think, like uh, what you used. Um, did you have a parent who was a graduate from the university, and did you have private education? I think those are quite important proxies for class, but they're not everything. And as I was saying earlier, some of the things that make up um, class and actually create barriers uh, are almost intangible. Uh, so I think, you know, it, it, I, I can't come up with a simple solution. I think we clearly need to do something about it, but I don't have easy answers. I think, I think a few things have been referred to, and one of them is um, collective organisation, because one of the big problems is that you've got, is if you're an individual faced with this, uh, you've got an enormous uh, barrier to overcome. Uh, if you're part of something a bit bigger, uh, they could be fighting for those rights, and that's, that's important. So, so the, um, there's saying as well that if, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it, and I think we've seen with the broadcasters have put a lot of effort into um, um, sort of BAME representation recently, and you know they've not had success, but there's a lot of quotas in there. And that is possible because that is being measured, and it's increasingly going to be measured more, uh, more accurately through the silver mouse system. Um, so I think that one of the key problems with working class and trying to make improve it is that it's currently not really measured by anybody working in the industries on an accurate, regular basis. So it can't be improved because no one knows really where we're starting from. So I think that would be a recommendation. We just see the end product of a very biased, um, you know, TV and, and film yeah. culture. Yeah. Um, yes, I'll push the floor. Yes, you want to? Um, the other hands up first. I'll, I'll push no, it just first. Just keep on keep on keep on keep on I'll give a very brief. The uh, question is, has anybody on the platform, or has anybody in the room, thinking of making a pitch for a multi-part series on the history of the working class? How it came into being after the bourgeois revolution of the 17th century? How, how it developed in the Industrial Revolution? And the, the, the development of, of the trade unions, first the universe called the skilled craft trade unions in the Nazis, and, the, and the general unions, the beginning of Marxism. The, the, the social revolutions in the early part of the, uh, <coughs> of the 20th century, the development of Stalinism, the, uh, the, the, the wars, the revolutions against Stalinism. A, a fascinating, a fascinating, does anybody agree? I'm not, you know, <laughs> I, I, me, I'm just a lowly documentary editor. Uh, uh, nobody listens to me, but when, there's all these eminent people yeah. on the platform. Uh, uh, the, 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 what's behind the question is the working class is an oppressed class. And there's infinite possibility for the ruling class to take elements out and take them into the house. Uh, and you're all right, but they're still down there. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, I work in education. I support a lot of young learners in inner city London. There you go, please. I support a lot of learners in inner city London in Lambeth who have been trying to get into the media. And we talked about like the BBC and stuff doing apprenticeships, but they've cancelled a lot of apprenticeships starting for the next academic year that they were previously putting on. And a lot of these young people are doing things like BTEC, so they're not going to go on to go through to be able to get anywhere near to the graduate route. And I've got learning difficulties, disabilities, mental mental health. What options are there for them? I mean, I I have an experience in terms of I used to be in the industry in print and trying to go back again, you know, in a freelance, but for me it was difficult and I've ended up in education. So what really is happening for BME people to give them the opportunity? Because for them, they don't see it reflected on their screens, they don't see opportunities for them to work and they happen to then turn out of having the creative ideas to do something different because they simply can't get in. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a desperate situation. Yeah, I mean, it's something the correct skill set are looking at and um, we're nowhere near being able to solve it but we've just launched a, an online sort of platform for these type of people to join called Hive which can link them into people who are willing to give them a chance in the industry. So I'd definitely recommend you to try and hook up with that and see if you can get some opportunities for that because they are available. Um, but yeah. Okay, the gentleman red and orange. Hi, uh, Ken, sorry to put you on the spot. I mean, Obviously, I think you know the problem, like this lady's trying to make a documentary, would you say, like, if you have the producers, you know, dish out the number so they can speak to them. And secondly, we obviously know, uh, maybe we need to hit them hard and say, not pay the license fee, bring back the quota, like in France, or three American films you show, one French film got made, things like that. I <laughs> 
Chester, you're good. Yeah, um, my name is Chester Young, uh, director and producer. Um, is not allowing working class stories or working class people to get in the industry, is it a form of censorship? Because if we think about the economic situation, the 1% who are mostly represented in our media today are ruling us, they're taking advantage of us, they're ripping us off, and they seem to be more represented than the working class people who are more than them. So is not getting in the industry from a working class background a form of censorship? Because I'm trying to make political films, okay? And I come from a working class background. And coming from Africa doesn't help either, and my accent. <laughs> so I face a huge barrier to getting in the industry, you know? I've gone all out there, make the films. For 12, 14 years, I've invested in my own personal finance to try and make films because I believed in them, because I wanted to make them. But no one in the industry, from Channel 4, BBC, Al Jazeera, you name them, I've tried to knock on their doors, but no one encouraged me whatsoever. Even if you say, okay, what you're doing is shit, but I can actually help you to make it better. Come, let me show you how to make it. But no one, no encouragement whatsoever. So is it a form of censorship? So we don't speak the truth. Yes, yes, yes it is. <laughs> As there's a, a women's committee and an uh, ethnic minorities committee in the union, is there a case for forming a, a class committee to mobilize action on this? And are you intending to do that? And maybe one of the things we could demand was that all, uh, all sort of vacancies and things should be openly publicized, so that everyone can see where they are and everyone could actually apply to do them. That would be one of the first things that may be possible to do. A bad idea, and I also think, yeah, you know, we're talking about what we can do. There's one thing very easily can do, which is make everyone be paid for work. Could you paraphrase what's being said? Sorry, he's asking if we should set up. Okay, I'll shout again. I was saying that we should. Just need to project on chat. I'm at the trade. Well, I'm saying that suggesting that as we have committees for promoting the rights of women and ethnic minorities in the union, we should do one that fights for better class representation in the union. And also, I think we should try and fight that employers are obliged to openly advertise all their vacancies so that they can be seen by everybody, so everybody has a chance to apply for them at least. Thank you. Um, does anyone on the panel have anything to say to the last few comments? Or do people want to ask questions? So that, yeah. And they can find that a lot of um, younger people are more posting stuff on YouTube, so there's a lot of short films on Vimeo and YouTube that are being made by um, people from lower classes, and they're, they're really good. So I was wondering if there was any reward system to encourage those filmmakers and maybe make them an example to the majority of the population in the UK. I mean, I don't know. Um, Cheryl Varley, who was going to be here, who works for the BBC, is their social mobility executive. She's been doing a lot of stuff online and trying to encourage people to, you know, make films online for the BBC, which then I think is a way into the BBC more generally. So, um, you know, I think hopefully that is something that's being recognised. And I've just sort of been struggling because, in a way, you know, we're, we're talking about breaking into a system which is poor system, you know, and it's like unless you're going to change the system, what we've got. I mean, everybody in this room is privileged to a certain extent because we're either in the union, well, we're probably in the union, or we've been to university, so already we're a privileged group, and there's not enough room for all of us, you know. So it seems to me, you know, like, it's like the people who are choosing, right? you know, like the commissioners, they commission people, their little group of people, their mates, the ones that they have, a, you know, it's a trickle-down problem. It's not just all us lot trying to get our little piece of the cake. I mean, I, I've worked in the industry for about 25 years, and now I'm in education, and so I've now got this worry that all these young people that I'm nurturing, where are they going to go? And it seems to me TV's not it, is it? You know, it's a smaller and smaller pot, and we need to encourage, you know, like the young guy at the back there, to be, to be our own bosses, you know, because you, you're never going to get that far if you're just 
trying to work with someone else. You know, and it's like those young, young, youthful organisations where we're working for each other that's probably a much better role model than trying to get a piece of this tiny, old, crumbling cake, which is a hierarchy <laughs> of people gripping onto their little bits of power. So it seems to me like a bit of a... Unless there's some way you can get rid of all the commissioners and put in a whole bunch of new, useful, working class, you know, ethnic, you know, diverse. <laughs> you know, I feel like the, the, the kind of point of actually everyone trying to channel into this tiny little space is gone. There are loads more variety of places to make films. You know, I mean, the crowd, you know, crowdfunding, it's like we need to be more open about supporting other means of making films. That's the exciting part, is making them. I agree, but I think also we should be more optimistic about the fact we can have change and we should be encouraging change within the existing structure. There are things we can do, you know, like you say, advertising for jobs, you know, stopping unpaid work. I mean, there are things, I agree, there's alternative routes, but there, there should be things we should be doing within the industry as well. Um, just take a couple more questions or comments from the floor and then go back to the panel. Yep. And I'm a little bit young, but from my understanding, in the 80s, when we were making programmes and we were making films again, most of the people who controlled access to film and TV were still from the other classes, in terms of commissioning and broadcasters. If that's true, so could be wrong, um, what do we think the difference is now that we're talking about people in other classes controlling that access in the big films? What is the difference as in making it happen? less about telling women about <coughs> and how can we try and shift it back to that more inclusive form of commissioning, even from people who aren't from the working class background? Uh, I can't really answer that. Uh, um, I, I'm just a wee bit wary of the golden age thing, mm. you know. And I, I, was it any better in the 80s, Ken? Uh, no, so it, sure. it was worse in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> People with long memories will remember that Channel 4 advertised for producers with a right-wing point of view. They had to advertise for producers from the right wing. And that was under pressure from the Thatcher government. The 60s was more liberal, with a small L. And it comes down to the question of when the ruling class is confident you can have more license to say controversial things. When they're less confident, when there is real danger that they're going to be threatened, then they close ranks and they stop you saying them. Um, and I say that, there were many victims, I mean, in the 60s, Peter Watkins was censored for um, a nuclear, a, a program about uh, nuclear weapons, the war game. They weren't confident about that, so they didn't want anything to go out. We were allowed to do one about homelessness because they thought, oh, we can deal with that. When we got to the 80s, the trade unions were presented as this fearsome, powerful monster that was going to govern the country. Um, and we did a few programs that showed that that actually wasn't the case and that the trade unions were colluding with Thatcher, and we got banned. So the, it, it's, uh, uh, the people who banned us, incidentally, was an alliance of right-wing Labourites, right-wing trade union leaders like Frank Chappell and Terry Duffy, for those of, again, long memories, um, and the, the then leaders of the SDP. So, in fact, it's, it's those with political power who are not confident that they can hang on to that power. That's when they censor. If they think, yeah, we, are, we, we say that we are a liberal democracy, we have all points of view, and they know that they can, they can uh, neuter those points of view, then you can say it. So it's, it's very interesting. But of course, the censorship only works when they, they commission the wrong programs in their eyes. The, the real control of ideas <coughs> happens at the commissioning or the producer level. They've made a mistake if you make a program that they don't want to show. They really cocked up. Uh, the, 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 the key thing is that control of, it's about control of consciousness and, and uh, remember that the, all television, the BBC particularly, is an arm of the state. Political appointments, same with, I don't know what the, I've forgotten what the independent broadcasting authority is now, but, uh, what it's called, it's got a different name. Um, 
but it, it's their political appointments. The heads of the television companies are political appointments. I mean, it was Chris Patton, Tory. Now it's a banker, isn't she? You know, involved in HSBC and up to her arms in, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say anything, but back pocket and job. Um, it's the, the, they're, they're political appointments. And they appoint the heads of channels, they appoint the news editors, who writes the news, critical appointment, and who the journalists they select. It's all top down, and the, the pressure to conform. What you can get away with was a key phrase, and I guess it still is, what can you get away with? Well, we can get away with saying that, but we can't get away with saying that. And so that, that control of consciousness is, is what TV is about. And they like people, I mean, Jimmy and I, in a way, have fulfilled similar roles at different times of being the voice they allow. We are the ones who show that, why, what's the problem? You've got Jimmy McGovern. He makes working class programs. Of course it's not biased. And so we fulfill that function of the, the I won't say the license <coughs> fool, but the, 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 the person who is allowed to say it to prove their point. But of course, the overwhelming majority of ideas they absolutely have in their fist. So, is it going to get better or worse now? Then um, I, I think it's I think it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse unless unions fight back, because a we've got very little political leadership. Um, the Labour Party, which should represent the unions, is saying we don't want union money. We're not in the hands of the unions. So they, they're, they're denying their connection with us. So we don't have that political representation. The pressure on the Tories to, um, to privatise the BBC is overwhelming, so the BBC is going to be more and more cowed. The marketisation and the privatisation of everything means that um, the workforce is more vulnerable, so there will be pressure for more and more people to work for nothing, more and more directed, photographed, edited, produced by one person will increase. And remember, when you see that, you're seeing a home movie, basically. You know, and that's their pressure. Um, and so the, the, the challenge is huge. You know, the challenge is huge. We, we are a union. We have to organize. We have to recruit. We have to get people into the, into the union. And we have to challenge them on, on all these. When people say, um, you know, it's a fair point, the point you make, about there are other ways to make films. Yes, there are, but but don't underestimate the the power of the big of the big broadcasters, because you see it at election times. They call the shots, you know. And we can have an underground movement, and we can have other ways of showing films, and that's great. But we shouldn't give up on the big organisations because that's what they want. They want us to give up. So we, we we've got to organise. We've got to recruit. We've got to be powerful. We've got to demand that other unions stand with us. And we've got to demand an end to, to work for nothing. It's like workfare, you know, now with workfare. The people, um, the, the minimum mit to live on, people are now told, well, you're not even going to get that unless you work for nothing. You know, and we can see that's the direction of travel. We see it in our industry. So it's a huge challenge to the unions, to the union movement, and to this union in particular. We've got to recruit, we've got to fight on the issues. across the whole country, you've spoken in Europe on this, 12, 15 years ago, and what you're saying is completely 100% true. There is censorship, and I, I applaud what the young man over there said. There's total censorship in the press. The controlling, you know, I used to have to work occasionally to David Cameron, who was at Carlson's yeah, country. Sure. Um, you know, they know how it works, they know how to censor. And I would go to the, whether he's still there or not, the young man who was at the back, who said, you know, lots of young people that I work with are bedroom entrepreneurs, they're making their own films. Obviously, they're not being paid. But I think we should have a special bit within the union as well. 90 pounds is a lot of money when you have a lot of money. Yeah. But maybe there should be a special 
you know, all the bedroom entrepreneurs, all the young filmmakers who are actually working class and doing it themselves. You know, when I spoke in Europe, Sky, BBC, ITV, all the men there, and they were all men, they all booed me. You can actually probably see it online somewhere because of what I said. And that, what I said was, you know, you, you, you pass on to the next generation and what you're doing is excluding the next generation, whether they're white, black, you know, working class, Asian or whatever. You know, we have a situation in this country where the ruling class is now, role, you know, their role is not just the political role, it's the corporate role. You know, when I go, used to go and represent ITV, they say, oh, you're a filmmaker. And I said, well, yes, but I'm here on the corporate side. You know, I think we have to vote with our feet, you know. Get the corporates, they're corporate companies, these television companies. They're public companies in the case of the BBC. You know, we should say to them, you're not fulfilling your social bottom line at all. You can't tick the box. You don't show disability adequately. You don't actually give control adequately. So neither the BBC, ITV, Channel 4, none of them actually tick the company box at the bottom, which is the quadruple bottom line. They're trying to tick the environmental bottom line, but believe me, they, they do not at the moment tick the social bottom line. As far as I'm concerned, you know, we, we did a lot of training within ITV, but they've cancelled it all. There is no paid training anymore. You know, packed. Who's doing the train, you know, the paid training? So I feel really, really passionate about this. I left my job partly to work across grassroots, and I see amazing, amazing creative people at grassroots in every industry in this country. TV, music, dance, theatre, fashion, and how do they get in? They can't, because there's this little group at the top give the jobs to their mates, to their kids' mates, and the same thing. So, let's change it. I just I, I totally empathise with everyone's feelings about how horrendous you know, the broadcasters are and all that type of thing. But it goes back to your point where I think we do have to try and try and make them better, and try and hold them to account, and try and and uh, and, and ensure that, that, that they they make strides to improve the situation, which they are in some areas. To be fair, and I think there's been a change in the last couple of years where they have tried to address things like ethnicity and, uh, and disability is going to become on the agenda, hopefully. Um, you know, and I think we just need to try and keep up the pressure, basically. Um, I, I think they try and tell us that um, we, have, we are a, a talking shop and we can't do anything. And I think we have more power than they tell us. And if we do join the union, if we do take them on on these big issues, unpaid interns, lack of diversity, not representing working class interests. And, and by the way, I think we can divide working class. I think it's about your relations to the, it's your economic relationship to production. Very simple. If you depend on your work for your, sell your labor, then you're working class. I think we do have strength. We're stronger than they tell us. If we join, if we join, if we make the union act for us, then we can take on the big organizations. If we don't, they can ride roughshod. At the moment, they're riding roughshod. It's a challenge to us. Like everyone, don't work in a, try not to work in a crew where there's people aren't in the union. Make certain they're in the union. And when we've got the membership, we can take them on. And then, then we can give advice to young filmmakers. Because at the minute, you know, people ask, what, what advice can you give to somebody starting out? Well, I can't, because the, the industry, as you said, the industry is stitched up. You can't give advice in that situation. What you can say is if you want to be in it, join the union, and then we have strength, and then we can change things, and then, then we can take them on. But until we do that, we can't. But we are stronger than they tell us. We do have strength. I don't disagree with anything. I think uh, um, you know I absolutely agree with Ken that uh, um, you should be 
uh, in a union if you're not in one. Um, I also think, uh, as someone said from the floor, or someone said at some point that you know one good idea would be to abolish the whole uh, range of commissioners and restart. Uh, but let, let's just deal with one final thing, which I think is about people, if you like, trying to get into the bottom and recruitment. Uh, now, I think that if you have public funding, and uh, this really means the BBC, you've got absolutely no excuse at all not to use a properly, fully robust method of recruitment uh, that, that, that has equal opportunities at its heart. That's absolutely uh, part of a public sector uh, equality duty. I think you, you must do that. If you are uh, a large private uh, or independent sector organisation, you don't have any excuse. Um, you, you may be, you know, it's not public money perhaps, but nevertheless, you still have uh, that obligation. The big problem, I think, is in the, is in the many hundreds of tiny uh, production companies uh, where an awful lot of people are employed. And I'm afraid this is one area where small isn't that beautiful. Uh, it's, very, it's much more difficult to get those um, small companies uh, to, to acknowledge these kinds of things, I think. Now, <coughs> trying to, uh, you want to end on a positive note, uh, a bit difficult to do, uh, uh, having got myself there. Um, but I, I think we do have to uh, push for um, methods of recruitment that don't rely on who's at the top of your mobile phone, uh, who you spoke to last, who you worked with last, etc. But actually, uh, does go on the basis of merit and equal opportunity. I've got to get a train pedal, so I can't hang around. I've got to be in the live of Ulster tonight by eight o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's easy for me to say this because I'm a writer and I'm still in demand. I haven't been found out yet. <laughs> and even when they find me out, I'll still get a couple of years. So, so, so I know it's easy for me to say this. Uh, um, but um, to work in TV uh, and have people almost be caught surprised, but, uh, caught surprised because something comes on the telly which sucks them in. They'd never pay to go to, go, go to the pictures to watch a film about the Hillsborough football disaster. But when it comes on in their living room and they get watching it and they stay with it, uh, it can have a mesmerising effect. Questions in the house. People thirsting for justice thought they had nowhere to go. That programme came on. Questions in their house. New inquiry, which has led inexorably to this new inquest that's going on. And to be part and parcel of an industry that has that power is amazing. And I, I think that's a positive note. We, shouldn't, we should fight like hell for it. I know, Ken. But we should never forget it either. You know. A very brief announcement. Uh, please join us at five o'clock in the reception area uh, for the last sort of grand finale of the day. A uh, very convivial atmosphere it's been, and that will be repeated down there. And what's more, you get a free drink on Bexham. Thank you very much.